Welcome back to another edition of the Wolverines Monday podcast. Of course, a pre-recorded show this week. Typically, we go live at 6 p.m. each Monday night, but decided to change things up this week. Uh, some other stuff coming up. We Clayton and I will be at the NFL Combine. We're going to talk about the NFL Combine here in a little bit. Obviously, uh, Michigan drops a tough game to Purdue on Sunday. We'll discuss that. And then at the end of our show, we will take questions as we do every week here on our Monday night show. But Clayton, welcome back to Man Booth today. Good to be back with you. Big week. I'm excited for my first trip to the Combine. We got a uh, steak dinner lined up for Friday night as well. Maybe uh, you know brushing elbows with some uh, big wigs down there, NFL coaches. So I cannot wait. Hopefully we run into our guy, Mike McDonald, who is now the head coach of the Seahawks and others. Maybe Jim Harbaugh. Maybe we'll have a beer with him. So I'm pumped. I know you've been before, but this is my first time and I'm excited to get down there. 18 guys down there from Michigan, which is a record. So we felt like we had to be there and I'm excited to see everybody compete and to talk to these guys too, how their preparation is going. Yeah, those 18 guys, of course. Uh, I'll just run them down here quick. J.J. McCarthy, Roman Wilson, Mike Sainer still, Chris Jenkins, Junior Colson, Blake Corum, Cornelius Johnson, Michael Barrett, Zach Sinter, Drake Nugent, Braden McGregor, A.J. Barner, Trevor Keegan, Ladarius Henderson, Jalen Harrell, Josh Wallace, Trent A. Jones, Carson Barnhart. And almost get out of breath reading those many, you know, that many names. And, you know, I guess here's where we'll start with this is, you know, until those guys hear their names called on draft weekend, you know, they are still, I mean, they'll always be Michigan Wolverines, but you know, until they, you know, wear the, the Detroit lions hat on draft night or the San Francisco 49ers hat or, or whomever it is, whoever selects them, they are still Michigan Wolverines. Uh, they are going through that process right now. And uh, to me, I think the thing that sticks out, you know, as I was putting that combine preview together earlier on Monday, which you can go read uh, over at, uh, the Wolverine.com is man. Oh man. I mean, I've got, you know, we've got physical copies of that national title magazine in our hands. Now you've got this long list of guys that we'll see this week at the NFL combine, just a, you know, really historic group on a number of fronts. But, you know, when you see those names on paper, or in this case, you know, on a computer screen, it really does just kind of show how good this team was, you know, despite all, there were all these other narratives on why Michigan was in the position that it was. But at the end of the day, when you send a program record, 18 guys to the NFL combine, that's you know, proofs in the pudding there, my friend. I mean, you have one of the top quarterbacks, one of the top running backs, one of the top wide receivers, a top 10 tight end, a few of the top offensive linemen, one of the top defensive tackles, one of the top linebackers, the top nickelback. Um, you could go on as well. You have even guys that didn't make the combine in James Turner, who I think has a shot to be drafted, one of the few kickers that go or be a priority undrafted free agent. Um, but the fact that you have six offensive linemen stands out. Uh, there's just you know so much to like about the talent Michigan had last year and what it is going to turn into, which is going to be a hell of a lot of draft picks in April. I, I think they have a good chance to break. Georgia's record set in 2022 of 15 draft picks. And Jim Harbaugh predicted that before last season. People kind of rolled their eyes a little bit, but it turns out that they're going to have a, a really good chance. So there's a ton of talent. And then you look ahead to next year as well in the 2025 draft. And Michigan may have three or four first rounders. Now, you probably wouldn't predict that, but there are four guys that have a legitimate shot to do that. Colston Loveland, Will Johnson, Mason Graham, and Kenneth Grant. Uh, so, you know, I think all of those guys will probably be within the first two rounds. So there was a ton of talent on last year's team. There's still some coming back, but yeah, I mean, 18 guys, it's going to be hard to keep track of all of them while we're down there. Uh, we'll be running our live blog over at, at the Wolverine.com as we always do. So basically anytime any of them does anything, uh, whether it's, you know, a notable quote or, uh, and we'll be covering all that separately as well, but uh, you know, a drill that they run timing uh, that they, that they put in a measurement, we'll have it tracked, but uh you know, it's always been kind of a, a tough job, but when you have 18, it's it's going to be that much tougher. Yeah, I think they had, what, nine last year, if I remember correctly. Like, it wasn't right. wasn't nearly that many. Uh, a couple years ago when when Aiden, you know, I, the first, I have only been once. That was the Aiden Hutchinson draft, and, you know, similar reasons to why we're going down there this year. I mean, Aiden could have been the number one pick that year. J.J. McCarthy, a guy who he's not going to go quite that high, we don't think, but... 
uh, a guy that as we head into this event, and let's maybe we turn to JJ McCarthy now, um, because you know what I had written down here was, well, who's the guy who has maybe the most to gain by uh, this week? And really, I, I think, well, I'll stop short of calling this a potential coronation week for JJ McCarthy. When he declared early for the draft, I think we all kind of sat there and said, you know what? Like right now, I get that when you look at the production, the statistics, a, a lot of the people not in the know, you know, people outside of our bubble might not see it, but this is, you know, NFL combine, the pre-draft process is going to be where this guy blows up. And a lot of people will start to see that. And really it, it seems like a lot of draft Twitter or, or some of those analysts have put on the film over these last few weeks. And you're starting to already see that stock rise for him, but you know, when that decision was made for him to declare for the draft, to leave Michigan, I think you and I both and a lot of other people looked at this week as being the week that would probably be the justification for him making that decision. It's kind of funny how draft media works because people are saying that, like, you know, oh, he wasn't, like, I think it was Daniel Jeremiah, was he wasn't in his first round of his first mock, and then nothing's happened, and a few weeks later, he's the number eight pick to the Atlanta Falcons in his next mock draft. And then everyone says, Oh, his stock is, is going up. It's like, well, no, now you're just realizing what his stock is because I think a lot of these mock draft, you know, analysts and, and everybody else who covers the draft are starting to learn more about what the NFL uh, scouts front offices feel about JJ McCarthy. And they've, they've been a high on him for a long time. So now this is kind of his opportunity. And it was reported on Sunday that he's going to throw at the combine. Some of the other top quarterbacks will not do that. Jaden Daniels, the uh, Heisman Trophy winner from LSU, not going to throw. A, you know, every year you see a lot of these quarterbacks kind of opt to just throw at their pro days. It's a more controlled environment. They get to pick out a lot of the drills that they're going to be running, specific routes. They get their wide receivers that they have a rapport with. But JJ, it sounds like, is not going to do that. And we'll talk to him on Friday morning about exactly why he made that choice. And then he'll throw on Saturday, which will be on NFL network and people can watch, but I'm excited to see him throw the football out there. Um, you know, you, you think about this guy as, you know, kind of a top tier competitor. He played 15 games last year, but he's still deciding to do this while others aren't going to, it is somewhat understandable. He's one of the underclassmen quarterbacks coming out. Kayla Williams being another um, Drake may being another, but you, you think about, you know, the bone Nicks, Michael Penix, like we kind of know, I guess what those guys are. I mean, scouts would definitely love to see them up close and personal, you know, um, in, in, in person there, but JJ is a younger guy. He's somebody that doesn't have as many throws on film, even though he's played a lot of games just because of the way Michigan's offense went. So I think that probably played a part in his decision, but I'm just excited to see him and what he can do this week. And you are seeing more people notice how good he is, you know, something we kind of already knew. Um, and, you know, that's interesting to see. And, and I think that he's a guy that's going to create some buzz this week if he, you know, everything goes according to plan. I certainly think that's the case. I mean, you know, if nothing else, I think because there are, and I get it, you know, there are a lot of guys to, to scout. And when the conversation is around Caleb Williams and Drake May and, uh, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, like there's a lot of really good quarterbacks in this, really good college quarterbacks in this class. And and what draws your attention, if you're a guy that just, you know, you're, I will not even say like as a, as an NFL scout, just someone who's in the profession that, you know, is, is in charge of tracking buzz on these guys, you know, the production, the gaudy numbers that a guy like Caleb Williams will put up that someone like Bo Nix or, Michael Penix will put up. That's what draws your eyes in. Um, and then a lot of those guys evaluate from there. Whereas I think, you know, it was pretty easy throughout this process to kind of ignore JJ because those numbers weren't so gaudy. But then when you do dive into the tape and, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, what, you know, let's see what all the hype is about. You know, this is still a, and first off, you know, college production is not even maybe in the top five to 10 things that a lot of these NFL front offices look at or evaluate when they are putting their draft boards together and things like that. But you you put on the film and, and they love more than anything else. These guys love traits and, and we know that JJ has the mobility. He's got the, you know, there was a, some kind of, I don't even know who it was. There was a narrative that JJ McCarthy was a quote unquote mid athlete. Like 
all you have to do is see the trick play in the Rose Bowl to know that that's not the case. Uh, you know, he's a mobile guy. We we know he's got the arm talent. He can zip it in there. Um, and then from an intangible standpoint, I mean, he checks a lot of those boxes too. So really, again, it, it does come down to this week for him. I think that that toolkit is, is there for him for sure. I mean, you know, this is the thing that gets me is, you know, to, to, I'd be interested to see the people who love the prospects like Trey Lance or Anthony Richardson and, and thinking those guys are these prototypical NFL passers compared to what some of these guys are saying about J.J. McCarthy, where he doesn't throw, didn't throw the ball enough and he's not, you know, as physically developed as some other guys. The guy just wins and he's extremely talented. So uh, to me, you know, assuming he checks all those boxes this week, I do think this is probably be a week that even just conservatively speaking, probably entrenches him as a top 15 ish prospect, maybe somewhere in that top 10. There's a lot of buzz with that as well, but you know, quarterbacks, it's not a great quarterback draft next year either. So I think you're going to see a lot of teams jockeying for position in this draft. And and that's good news for JJ McCarthy. And I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, maybe one of the biggest reasons he did decide to declare is that, um, Maybe teams are going to be a little higher on everyone this year because you are jockeying for position, but we'll see. I mean, there's a lot to sort out there still, but for this week in particular, uh, I think he's the guy with the most against from a stock perspective. Is there anyone else on this list that you think going into this event with a big week, we can probably start having maybe first round discussions about them or, or someone that can rise up quite a bit. Well, yeah, I, honestly, I don't know that JJ to me is the guy with the most to gain. Cause I think he's already so high and there's kind of a, a block there where it's like, I don't think he's going to be a top three quarterback, but I think he's between four and five. Maybe he can solidify himself as four, but to me, I, I think he's getting picked in the top 20. I think he could get picked in the top 10, likely top 15. You, you know, there are a number of teams that could use a quarterback Atlanta, Seattle's one of them, uh, Denver, you know, the Raiders could take one. And JJ is going to interview extremely well this week too. Um, but before I, I mention a couple other guys, who's going to run faster in the forty, JJ or Blake Corum? Ooh, that's a really good question. I didn't know. Where, oh, um, I sneakily think it might be JJ. Like I wouldn't yeah, be way- surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if Blake Corum ran like a four five five. That people are like, oh, he's not that fast. I know I'm a little I'm a little nervous about Blake's forty. Um, and so here, here's something we have to talk about too. When you mentioned these Michigan players going, they've had less time to prepare for the combine than a lot of these guys. I mean, some people, if their team was in a bowl game, they opted out and they had five six extra weeks of preparation on these Michigan guys. Roman Wilson talked about it at the Senior Bowl, but he basically went from Houston to Mobile for the Senior Bowl week. And I mean, they wouldn't trade that experience. They were putting you know, stuff on film. They were still, of course, practicing and, you know, doing everything they needed to do to their bodies during those game weeks. So it's not like they're out of shape or anything, but there's just a difference between preparing for a game and playing in a game than preparing for the combine. Like Blake Corum, would he have slimmed down maybe a little bit more? And we'll see what he weighs in at and looks like at the combine this week. But would he have slimmed down if he had a little bit of extra time, maybe to run a faster 40, sacrifice a couple reps on the bench press, we know when he bulked up last spring, and I think he got up to nearly 220 uh, last spring, we know that he put up 30 uh, reps on the bench press. Now the camera's blocked a little bit. We can't tell how much Herb was helping him out, but they said it was 30, and it looked like 30 to me. So, uh, yeah, I don't know that he's going to be to get 30 in this. Maybe he has you know, worked a little bit more on trying to get that 40 time down, but that's going to be – that's one of the most things that, that – um, you know, that I'm interested to see this week is Blake Corum's 40 time. I think he has a decent amount to gain. The interesting thing with Blake too, is that, you know, one of the things he's really done to his game over the last two years is added that power and power is not necessarily something that's going to show up a ton in the combine just because they're in shorts and everything else. Now the bench press will be one of those areas, but it'll, you know, and I don't think anyone's worried about his strength on the bench. Like if he gets 20, two or 24 or whatever it there's no difference i mean blake corum is extremely strong i mean look at any photo of him he's he's ridiculously strong it's almost funny to watch him walk around when we're around him because you know he's kind of short but he's got that build um so i think blake could have you know some upward mobility 
when you think about this week, I think scouts are going to be really excited to see Mikey Sainer still in person. Roman Wilson is a guy who impressed at the senior bowl, but now, you know, and, and they saw him do it in drills there during the practices. He was kind of one of the top standouts. And then now it's going to be, okay, if he can run the ridiculous shuttle that he was timed at, at Michigan, which was uh, Ben Herbert told, told us last summer, his three cone drill was 6.20. That was reported by Bruce Feldman. And then Ben Herbert told us he ran a 371 20 yard shuttle. So if those times are anywhere near those hand time ones from Herbert, um, then plus what he did at the senior bowl. I mean, he's a guy that could get himself late first round, early second. Um, Mikey's a guy that could get himself in the second round. I think people are going to be interested to, to look at junior Colson. They're already high on him. Um, you know, Zach Zinter is going to interview. I, I assume he's not going to do much. Maybe he'll bench or something like that. But then you have all the offensive linemen. You have AJ Barner. I mean, there's so many storylines with this draft. So yeah, I named a few of them. I mean, you know, Jalen Harrell, I think is somebody that could impress in some of these, you know, testing, uh, you know, things. And I look, I, I think that there are just a number of guys, Mike Barrett too. Um, but that's, you know, you could really name all of them. Almost did name all of them. It was like being at a Jim Harbaugh press conference again. Or yes, yeah, didn't name any walk but... <laughs> Um yeah, I think there's pretty safely I think six guys right now that we're probably looking at, you know, you know, either round one or day night one or night two. I uh, know that night two is rounds uh two and three, but mm -hmm. uh just going through the list here, someone who I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe not make the leap quite as high as, as Luke Schoonmaker did last year, but AJ Barner, a PFF currently has him at 174th on their big board. I could see him being a guy that tests well at tight end. Um, maybe you see him sneak into, um, you know, again, the early part of, again, the draft is still two months away. So that this is all super premature, but um, got to remember that this is more of a, a workout type of event. So I think that, that bodes well for guys like Chris Jenkins. I think Chris Jenkins will have probably um, I, I foresee us having some things to talk about with Chris Jenkins coming out of this combine. Good call. Um, yeah. Other than that, let's see here. I mean, there's just so many guys. I think we're you and I, I mean, we typically uh, a little inside baseball here. We typically have draft stories pre-written heading into the event. We just kind of plug in the teams when those guys come off the board. We're going to be very busy uh, all weekend, but probably mostly on Saturday, uh, assuming that, you know, they do have maybe 12 guys that could uh, come off the board after that first six that we just named, you know, JJ McCarthy, Roman Wilson, Mikey Sainer still, his stock is already rising. Again, people putting on the film, cleaning things up from the end of the season. Um, Jenkins, Colson, Corum. I think that group of six is probably your headlining group in this event. And we'll see what happens with the other guys, but um well, Barner, yeah, uh, to, to go with what you said about A.J. Barner, I I agree. And, you know, part of it is because it's similar to J.J. McCarthy, right? I mean, the opportunities when you're A.J. Barner and you're playing a lot in line and Colston Loveland is playing with you and he's going to be more of a top target, you're not going to get as many opportunities. It's funny, A.J. Barner said something last year where he said he was asked about being a blocking tight end. And he said, when I was at Indiana, I was never considered a blocking tight end. You know, it was actually part of his game that he was trying to improve. And then he comes to Michigan and he's known as just this beast of a blocker. I mean, he's like six foot seven. And I mean, you just watch him time and time again. I thought the tight end blocking was so key to Michigan's offense this past year. And AJ Barner and Max Bredesen were a big piece of that. But, you know, he was a pass catching tight end at Indiana. We saw it in flashes at Michigan. I think he only had around 250 yards, but he's somebody that's probably going to test well. They're going to love his wingspan, they're going to love his height. And he's going to do well in the drills. So he he is absolutely somebody I think that could be could turn some heads. I think that's a good call. Question I just thought of uh, here now: Jim Harbaugh, according to the schedule, won't speak. Uh, his GM Joe Hor uh, Joe, Joe Hortiz will speak at uh, the combine. Um, when you look at this list of eighteen guys, who's the guy that you think Jim Harbaugh? And maybe it's even more at the the tail end of the list. But who's Who's the guy on here that you think he's probably pounding the table for? Yeah, so Chris Ballas and I did this on the pod two weeks ago after the invite list came out. And I, I said Blake Corum because I think they could lose Austin Eckler in free agency. And I also said Mikey Sainer still. I mean, I don't know their exact situation at nickel right now, but 
And he's just a guy you want on your team. And I think so many other franchises are going to say that. So it's easier said than done, right? He might not have the opportunity to get Mikey San Russo, whether that's in the second round or the third. I mean, but but you could go down the list with guys that Jim Harbaugh loves. And we know that he loves these guys because we've heard. He's going to grab at least one of them, right? Like that is the he lock has. of the century. I would hope so. And I think the Ravens are going to do the same. And I think the Seahawks are going to do the same. I think <laughs> you already look at with Joel Klatt has kind of broken this down and I'm going to write about it this week, but the Seahawks, the way they're trying to build this thing would be a perfect fit for JJ McCarthy. And I think they have the 16th pick. I could be wrong about that. And Mike McDonald already has that relationship with him. So man, you know, with a good defense, you have a good running game. You have Kenneth Walker there. And, you know, I think JJ would much prefer to be on that guy's team than playing against him uh, as we've seen. Yeah. And, you know, so that could be a fit there. So I think we're going to see a lot of those. You know, the Ravens already take a lot of Michigan guys. I wrote about this a year or two ago when they took a couple. And you look at the just the teams that they select from, Michigan was the the highest rate of, uh, you know, in terms of what school they select from. So we're going to see it with the Ravens. I think we're going to easily see it with the Chargers. I hope so, because it'll be more fun to follow those guys and, and the, you know, Jim with the Chargers and everything. I know that, uh, the brand grows, you know, it goes from one team and now you've got these three footholds for Michigan. So, uh, the schedule's up there on the screen right now, uh, interviews, uh, we will not be there for the defensive linemen and linebackers, but we'll be there Thursday through Saturday, um, defensive backs and tight ends on Thursday, running backs, quarterbacks, wide receivers on Friday. That'll be a big day, obviously. And then Saturday is, uh, the offensive line day. And then of course the, their workout days are the days after that. Uh, they do the media interviews. So uh, each of those guys pretty much gets two days in the spotlight, so to speak, at least publicly. I know there's meetings that happen, at, you know, at Prime 47 and St. Elmo's and guys are going out to dinner and guys are meeting with agents and stuff behind the scenes. So a lot of movement, super fun networking event, um, not just for the players, but a lot of people in our profession as well. So excited of course we actually have we have an agent that wants to buy us a beer too not kidding so oh well that'll be good if you're an agent out there that wants to uh, buy us a beer or steak uh i'll send the the google form around collect your information so um any other thoughts on the combine clay i think we pretty much covered it here no just excited yeah all right well let's move on to michigan basketball um something not quite as exciting to talk about, but Sunday was actually a pretty exciting day. Uh, number three, Purdue comes into town. And again, in a lot of ways did feel like a, um, I won't say a Purdue home game, but definitely one of those, those big 10 tournament type of split crowd type of deals. I don't know that it was um, a majority Purdue fans, but they had the majority of the things to cheer about. Michigan loses on Sunday in, in a game where it didn't have Jalen Llewellyn, didn't have Olivier Kamwa. Actually, you know, I thought wire to wire, they played pretty well. Um, the officiating wasn't great, but I'm not going to sit here and say that that was a the reason they lost the game. But um, the way that Purdue and Zach Eady is officiated in general, I think is a bit of a problem, not just for the Big Ten, but uh, also for Purdue's chances in March when the officiating does change a little bit. Um, at the end of the day, like not good enough to win a game like that, but I uh, just felt like there were a few moments, some some bad calls. There were a handful of, uh, I mean, th to me, the key stretch in that game was when they're waiting for that under four timeout to come in the first half and Purdue's going on a run. You've got guys like Will Cheddar out there clutching at his chest, just gassed and, and uh, never quite got that timeout in. And to me, that was the difference in the game Sunday. But uh, this team now sits at 8-20, and 20, uh, three games left in the regular season, I believe it is. Uh, they've clinched a spot in one of those Wednesday night games in the Big Ten tournament. I mean, really running out of things. Again, it's already been slim to none in terms of things to have, you know, having things to hang your hat on, so to speak. But, um, you know, what did you make of what we saw Sunday, Clay? Yeah, I mean, when you're depleted on the front line, it's going to be hard to hold up against that team. And specifically that player. I mean, Zach Eady goes for 35 and 15. He's 14 of 18 from the field. He made seven free throws. And, you know, when you're facing foul trouble as well, that made the, the task even tougher. You know, you're always going to get those those calls that, that Edie's going to draw. He leads the country and fouls drawn per 40 minutes. He drew 11 yesterday. But some of the frustrating calls, like you mentioned, were 
not even involving Zach Eady. And there were some ticky tacky mm-hmm. stuff that really made a what was already depleted and decimated, you know, Michigan roster with injuries and you know illness and Will Cheddar too. I mean, give him credit. He was sick with the flu, wasn't able to play Thursday, comes back and you know plays a huge role in that game. And you're right. I mean, he was he was so gassed just trying to get up and down the floor at the end of the first half. But I mean, Namari Burnett, even a guard, you know, who never matched up with Zach Eady, only played eight minutes in the first half because of foul trouble. Purdue gets in the bonus, you know, free throws definitely helped them. But the, I think the story was giving up what 14 was it? Offensive rebounds. And, yeah. you know, it was just tough because Michigan had to go zone, especially when it was undersized with the foul trouble, where you, there were times when there was no Cheddar or Terrace Reed in the game. But, you know, going with the zone, it worked somewhat, uh, especially compared to some of the man-to-man numbers, but it did not help you when it came to securing defensive rebounds. Purdue was able to feast with uh, you know, how many second-chance points did they have? Um, let's see. Too many. 24, yeah. So, I mean, th- there's there's kind of the difference. It's another game where the other team takes, you know, almost double-digit more field goal attempts than you because of either offensive rebounds or turnovers and you know turnovers weren't the issue in this game Michigan only had 10 I thought the offense played pretty well and it's completely different when Doug McDaniel's on the floor so now you look to you know Doug has not played as well at home as he would have if he was playing in the road games either it's not like he's just coming back in these home games and playing you know his a game every time it's hard to do that on and off on and off two straight road games now it's spring break Jawan Howard said yesterday that they're going to find out today whether or not they're going to have Doug for the game Thursday at Rutgers and then Sunday at Ohio State. So I think the one thing you can hang your hat on is if you are able to have him for the next couple games and preferably the Big Ten tournament, you at least have some game-to-game continuity as to what your team looks like because that offense worked pretty well on Purdue. You just didn't get enough stops or defensive rebounds. Yeah, and again, you know, as attention turns, you know, they'll make the decision on what happens – after this year in terms of the coaching stuff, like that's going to be made. But again, you know, knowing this team does have four and maybe five games left if they win a big 10 tournament game, because certainly, you know, any of those, anyone they could play in that big 10 tournament would give them a chance to win a basketball game. But, um, you know, their standing is the worst team. in The big 10 is what it is. But that being said, you know, if you're able to get Doug McDaniel back, you know, all of a sudden, like you have, you have, something that resembles a nucleus back for these, these last four, maybe five, who knows, maybe six games. I don't know. I'm not going to sell something that I don't know is, is all that realistic, but you know, why not, I like that? That, why not Michigan? Why not? It's I just mathematically love how possible. Teams, how many teams are going to make a graphic or like a hype video with that as either the title or the text on the graphic? Why not us? Yeah, of course. In the next two um, weeks, you know, a couple positives. I feel like, I'd like to, uh, and, and despite wanting to see these guys more, I think they should play more. I, I like the glimpses we get from uh, Yusef Kayat and George Washington. I think both of those guys should probably play a little bit more. Um, you know, would love to see that these last three games, last four games, last however many games. Um, Terrence Williams, you know, he's been a polarizing guy over the last few years, but I, I actually think he's weirdly, and again, you know, no one's going to throw a parade for how it's gone down, but he's weirdly been like a calming, steady presence on this team, despite it being, you know, an eight and 20 season thus far. And he um, took some you know, shots. He, just, he took some shots at the fans yesterday. The fans really let him have it last year. And that was not, you know, I didn't love some of the, what was coming at him on social media. T won't and all this stuff, but he kind of let him have it again yesterday for not showing up and having the Purdue fans take over. Yeah. I mean, maybe we talk about that for a second because you know, I'm past the point of that being something that we should be bothered by because one, we already saw it happen last week. Not maybe not quite to that extent. I think not even as loud, as loud and as, you know, as into the game as Michigan state fans were a week or so ago, uh, it was still probably like 70, 30 Michigan fans yesterday was, was or Sunday was pretty close to if it wasn't 50 50, it was darn close and credit to them. I mean, that's a six hour drive uh, for Purdue fans and they have a very good team. And, you know, if you can get them for the same, you get tickets for the same price as, you know, a couple Cokes, why not make the drive on a Sunday afternoon? But uh, 
is that it's it's more eye opening more than anything. Um, I don't know that I'm all that bothered by it because why why should we criticize Michigan fans for not showing out in droves to watch a team that has only won eight games this year? Um, you know, it's a it's a time and a money commitment to do those things now. So I don't. That's just I guess that's just the way we are now as a as a sports watching society. Like if you're not giving these folks something to stick around, and again, the students were on spring break as well. Um, but if the product's bad, I mean, I can't, I can't really blame fans, uh, for not fighting the Purdue fans out of the building. Yeah. I mean, Terrence Williams said that whenever they play on the road, no matter the record of the opponent, their fans show up. I mean, it's, it's just not true having watched it throughout the years. I mean, some fans obviously show up and, you know, some places are easier for Michigan fans to travel to than others. But I mean, I remember a couple of years ago over winter break when they played at Maryland and it was, you know, basically completely dead, um, you know, and you could go on and on. Northwestern has had those years. So, you know, that that's kind of just, it's the way it goes. And maybe it's the worst he's ever seen. And he can only tell us, you know, what he's seen. And, and, you know, I, I have no problem with any comments that, that he made. I, I don't care too much about, you know, the fan split or whatever, in terms of, you know, all it means is that they're not good. And we already knew that. And all it means also is that Purdue is very good. You know, when I was a fan uh, five, six years ago, I went down to Purdue and watched Michigan play. And, you know, I wrote about this in the preview coming into the Purdue game because I knew that there was going to be a lot of Purdue fans there where they're kind of on a war path right now. I know, I know they lost that game to Ohio State. It was probably a wake-up call. And, you know, but they I think they had won seven or eight before that one. They're kind of cruising here as they head into the tournament. And Michigan has been in this spot so many times that you understand it. Like, th that's going to be a game that Purdue fans travel to that they get up for even if you're not at the game i mean you're just excited to see that your team play as they kind of make their run into march and if you're a michigan fan you're going to easily forget this game and that's just the way it goes michigan's been on the other end of it for so many years purdue's had down years as well but to me it's just an indication of where both teams are at and that's that's where they're at purdue's looking and purdue is especially like this is a kind of a two-year type of thing for them. If I don't know if they're going to be Virginia and win it all after losing to a 16 seed the year before, but I think people are pretty geared up for this run because there's a lot riding on what Purdue does in, in the postseason. Yeah, and just on Purdue, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I think that the things that ailed them last year, uh, I think their guard play was always going to work against them. That's improved. I like the pieces that uh, they have around Zach Eady. So we'll see, but again... I, but just the way you go back, was it a game against Northwestern? I forget what it was where, where Edie or Purdue had like 46 free throws compared to the other team had eight. It's just, it, it seems like a lot of times, and it wasn't that lopsided in terms of free throws yesterday, but uh, was that when Chris Collins got, he was very creative in his press conference at like, just kind of mentioning, Oh wow. Boo only had, you know, Boo only shot four free throws and then he yeah. would move on to the next topic. And, um, I think he ended up getting fined for that, even though I, I thought he skirted the line, you know, pretty well. But yeah, I just, line. I just, I don't like how they officiate that team. That's all. It's a, it's a gripe. But uh, uh, it'll be kind of that funny. Crew, that crew was terrible yesterday. There's no question. It was. Uh, it'll be kind of funny when they get popped by like a nine seed in the NCAA tournament, though. So that's all right. Um, well, uh, in terms of basketball, you know, uh, doesn't show up in the box score, but uh, if if Hart was in the box score. Michigan would have won that game. So at least that's something to hang your head on uh, coming out of that game against Purdue. Let's move into questions, Clayton, to close this out here. I had a couple uh, from the message board I wanted to take for the show, and we'll start with this one from Sasquatch616, who says, do you think it's a good idea for JJ to throw at the combine, or would it be safer to wait until his pro day like other top quarterbacks are doing? Does he stand to gain enough in the eyes of the scouts to, the scouts to warrant the potential risk? Uh, I look at it like similar to um, at least in terms of his evaluation, like think back to taking the ACT in high school, like you can take the ACT and really whatever happens, uh, you have a chance to retake the ACT later on. If you're not happy with your score, or if you have something to uh, that you want to improve with it, uh, I think, you know, all of these right now, I think with JJ, we talked about this a little bit earlier on. I think these scouts are looking for justification or reason for some of the hype that's materialized since the end of the season. And, you know, to see a guy 
it's going to be, you know, nationally televised. Everyone that evaluates, you know, this sport will be watching the quarterbacks throw on Saturday. Um, you know, given that Caleb Williams isn't going to throw, given that Jaden Daniels isn't going to throw, I think that kind of puts the spotlight on him. And I think that that's, I think that's a good thing for him ultimately. I agree. And by the way, I, I got a worse score every time I took the ACT. So I, I just ended <laughs> I up going too. with the, just submit the first one. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. And here I am, you know, they don't even care at this job what my ACT was. So um, <laughs> I've never, no, I've never I once agree. been asked that. What's that? I've never once been asked what my ACT score was. Uh, I don't even think in college applications, but right. then again, I'm a, you know, anywho. <laughs> but no, I, I think that the way you put it with being in the spotlight, given what the other guys are doing is a good point. And, you know, teams are going to want to see a lot out of a guy if they're going to use a first round pick on them. It's risky. Even, you know, first round picks pan out at about a 50% rate as is. And you would think that these are complete locks, you know, that these guys know what they're doing, these evaluators and GMs and everything. Well, there's a reason why there are so many, it's just really hard to evaluate the, the position. So much goes into it. There's so much that you can't project. There's a reason why so many GMs get fired every year. There's job openings and guys moving around. It's because it's really hard to do this stuff. So they want to see a lot if they're going to put their job on the line to take you as a first round quarterback. I think somebody's going to do that again, like we said earlier in the top 20, I would predict, but JJ McCarthy has to show them enough, uh, you know, for that to happen. And I think that's why this is, this is a good opportunity for him. I, I wouldn't have blamed him if he decided not to, I wouldn't have said that was a bad decision. So I guess I can't say this is a great decision to do it, but I think it's a fine decision and I think he's going to do well. Yeah. I mean, some guy, Marvin Harrison Jr. Isn't working out for teams at all. Apparently, obviously different position, but uh, he's he not need to. To, <laughs> he doesn't need to. He's the, he is the best. He's the best player in the draft, regardless of position for what my money's worth. But, uh, you know, maybe the numbers would have been a little bit better with better QB play, but I guess we'll never know. I guess we'll never know. Uh, we'll move on to, this one is addressed directly to you, Clayton, from Bloomer, who says, after seeing Darrell Brooks in person this past week, how do you feel about him as a commit, and do you think his star ranking is underrated? Well, Bloomer, fellow Grand Rapids Catholic Central grad, Darrell Brooks, Grand Rapids Catholic Central senior. I was there on senior night on Friday as they played Wayland, and, and this is partly why I say, no, I, I don't think he's underrated. I don't think he's overrated. I don't have an opinion coming out of that game on his ranking one because I haven't seen all the other players that are either ranked behind him or ahead of him. So it's tough for me to evaluate and I'll leave that to other people. And two, they played Wayland and no disrespect to Wayland. Wayland used to be good when I, when I was in high school, they're terrible. They won four games all year. Catholic central won 73 to 34. It was a running clock in the second half of a basketball game. Uh, for, you guys are shooting free throws. Clock's running. Never seen it before. It was that bad. So yeah, he dominated. He had 24 points. I mean, he kind of just cruised through the game. We have the highlights up on the YouTube channel here uh, at the Wolverine. So people can check those out. We'll have thoughts and then an interview with him as well on the site at the Wolverine.com. But no, he was good. I mean, he, he made four threes. His shot has been something that he has admitted that he wanted to work on coming into the year. He's had quite a few games with uh, three, four made threes this season, he said. So that's a positive. He can get out and Run in transition. It's impressive how he runs in the open floor. He did miss a couple shots at the rim. You know, could have had a few and ones. Ended up, you know, missing the layups and going to the line for two free throws instead. So I mean, he was still being productive, but felt like he could have finished a little bit better. He looked a little. He looked disappointed about that. Um, but no, I think that that you know he's kind of the solid player that we knew he was, and I'm excited. I'm going to try to get out to a. Uh, playoff game they have a pretty manageable division here so if they go into next week i think i'm going to get out to a playoff game and see that so i should know a little bit better bloomer after that but it was fun to get out there and watch some high school basketball yeah, i haven't been to a high school basketball game in a long time uh, they're electric so popcorn it's good it's real good popcorn's popping we'd love to see it uh let's take this one from j underscore who says should colel mullings be considered rb1 uh he has a couple here so we'll just We'll start with that one. Um, Kalel Mullings, where do you think he fits into this backfield? Because again, I think Donovan Edwards coming back makes him, I think at least on paper, maybe the de facto number one. But again, he's a guy that 
you know, history will show that he technically was the third running back into the game in that national title game before he, you know, had his his two touchdowns. So second. Oh, you're saying Donovan? Yeah, yeah. Kalel was second. Yeah, yeah. Kalel was second. Yeah, my bad. Sorry, my I confused bad. myself. All good. Um, Kalel Mullings, a guy that uh, I think at times this year we talked about wanting to see him get the ball maybe a little bit more, but again, you know, giving him the ball more maybe didn't necessarily mean taking carries away from Donovan Edwards. It probably meant taking carries away from Blake Corum, which is something that really wasn't ever going to happen. But you know, how do you feel about that? As a you know, I wrote about the running backs last week. I could easily see those guys being one A and one B um in in any configuration, but you know, wouldn't be wouldn't surprise me to see him have, you know, a Hassan Haskins type of breakout at all. Yeah. So Michigan's kind of gone with the Bell Cow route the last two years. And that coincides with Blake Corn being the guy. Like you I, you said it right there. Like I don't I'm not in favor of taking carries away from Blake Corum pretty much ever. I mean, other than a change of pace and to give him a blow. Um, and I thought he could have ran the ball more last year. It seemed like it was a priority for them to keep him healthy. And I thought that was smart and it worked out. They won the national championship. So, but I, I could see something similar to the beginning of the 2021 season when it was Hassan Haskins and Blake Corm. And then Blake Corm goes down with an ankle injury. Hassan Haskins had to really carry the load down the stretch. You know, even when Blake played against Ohio state, he was kind of banged up, had the big game against Iowa. But before that, people kind of forget how much of a – not by committee because it was kind of just two guys, but how much that thunder and lightning duo was a real thing. Like Blake was – you know, had just about as big of a role as Hassan Haskins did that year. And I think we could see something similar this year. I wouldn't rule out Donovan Edwards being your number one guy and Kalel Mullins being kind of the change of pace. I also wouldn't rule out it being a little closer to – a split and then you kind of use them situationally we know donovan's a great receiver we also know donovan is probably going to benefit from having a healthy offseason this year something he didn't have a year ago i think that was something underrated when you look at why he didn't have more success last year so i think he could be considered as running back one if i was talking to kalel mullings i would say go get the job you know i would say the same thing to donovan edwards but um you know i think he's talented and i think we're going to see more of him this year clearly and i think that we're going to learn more that he's more than just you know a power back or short yardage guy. I think he's he has a chance to be really good and play in the NFL one day. I mean, we can see him get down the field and catch passes like the that play of the Rose Bowl. So that was a huge uh, play. I get, yeah. yeah, it really is. I've watched that game more than a few times now since we we got back from that trip, and uh, that play doesn't get talked about enough, uh, crazily enough. But yeah, spring ball is going to be really interesting in sorting out that pecking order because you know obviously I know there's a lot of hype around Jordan Marshall, but he's a true freshman and he won't be there until uh until fall camp. So for me, I mean it's it's Donovan Edwards, it's Kalel Mullings and it's everyone else right now. So how that how that winds up being divided up, we'll see, but uh I think you know in the here and now, um I think that's kind of how it shakes out. Uh, we'll take this last one here from I lost it. Um uh, Miss Vixen wants to know Will Jawan Howard be that coach next year for the men's basketball team? And will the women make the NCAA tournament? I know we've talked about Jawan Howard a lot. Um, I don't know. I truly don't know if he will be the head coach next year. And I was, uh, Clayton, while you were uh, discussing Mr. Mullings there, uh, I did look up the latest women's bracketology uh, from ESPN, and they still have Michigan as a 10 seed uh, playing Oklahoma in the first round. Uh, they've lost a lot of winnable, maybe resume building games this year, but uh, as of now, ESPN still has them in. But uh, so that's my my two cents there on that. But any thoughts on those two questions? Yeah, I think. What was the first question? I was going to say, who will says Juwan Howard be here next year? Oh, will Juwan Howard be? I was going to say, who says they're not playing? Uh, Michigan basketball is not making the NCAA tournament. It seems like KBA is going to get her team there again. So kudos to them, but. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, I think it's probably about 50-50. You know, there's not a ton of indication coming out as to what Ward Manuel is going to do. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he stayed. I wouldn't be surprised if he was let go. I mean, to be completely honest with you. So, I mean, it's it's a boring answer, but I can't just sit here and make some bold prediction about it. Can we take the, the one about uh, how far away is Denegal from surpassing Orgy? Oh, that's right. Uh, back to J underscore. Uh as he says, 
How far away is Jane Denegal from surpassing Alex Orgy? Uh, why don't you start we, on that one? Are we sure he's behind him? I don't know that we are. I mean, he was. I don't know that we are. Quicker into uh, Jaden Denegal was in games quicker than Alex Orgy was until the end of the year, and they didn't play any backup quarterbacks anymore except for Alex Orgy. But that was situationally that was you know kind of completely different. That was aside from the depth chart, in my opinion, because. He's a dynamic athlete, and he was essentially your Wildcat quarterback. So I'm not sure there is a ton of separation there either way. Like I, I think Denegal might be ahead of Orgy. He was early in the year. I know Orgy was coming off an injury in uh, fall camp that set him back. But you know, I think they're kind of right there. I had him as an or in our way too early depth chart back in January, and now Jack Tuttle's in the mix. So probably Tuttle, and then those two right, you know, neck and neck behind him. Yeah, I feel like it's Jack, it's Tuttle or Orgy or Denegal right now. And then I'd have uh, probably Davis Warren and Jaden Davis, you know, battling it out in that next tier. But yeah, I, I don't, we'll see what spring ball winds up looking like. But, you know, there's something about Jaden Denegal where, you know, he's 6'5, he's 235, he's got the height, he's got the build. I mean, you getting off the bus, he looks like a college quarterback. Um, and actually, obviously, or limited tight end. number of throws. He or tight, or he could be a Popeye's biscuit away from being a tight end as well. Um, you Shout know, he's four Kelsey. for five. <laughs> uh, he was four for five for fifty yards. His first career touchdown this year. And and given, I mean, take this for what it is, but PFF had him graded as actually Michigan's second best passer on the team uh, with seventy one point one. So, um, case closed. Yeah, there you go. I, I think. Could I see him maybe being a Wilton Spate type? I don't think that would like, I don't think that's crazy to think. Um, I know he's kind of, you know, it, it hasn't been like, he, he's been a name that's kind of always been percolating behind the scenes and it hasn't, you know, maybe not popped to a certain extent, but I know Kurt Campbell likes him a lot. I think when we talked to him at uh, the Rose bowl at the national title game, he had mentioned him as the guy that maybe in that quarterback room has improved the most or had improved the most from start to finish last year. So yeah, I think, I don't think this is Jack Tuttle or Alex orgy or a transfer. I think it could be those two guys plus Denegal plus a transfer potentially depending on, or depending on how spring ball goes. So um, I think he, I definitely think that he's in that mix. And um, you know, if we're talking purely, from a passing standpoint, maybe slightly slight leg up on Orgy, but obviously Alex Orgy has you know brings all those other tools to the table as well. So we'll see what happens. But I I do think he's in the mix. I, I don't think this is just a two horse race right now. Does Denegal use this, the spirals on the ball? He throws a wobbly ball, but he he can he can throw that thing. Um, it'll be interesting to yeah, it's gonna be interesting to watch those guys in the spring game. And then J underscore can Gio be an All American real quick? I can I, I'm never like a guy that says no, you can't do this or whatever. I would not predict it, but could he be close to like a, what a Trevor Keegan has given you the last couple of years? I think absolutely this year. Giovanni yeah, I mean, Alhadi, that is for people that don't know. Can can he? Sure, will he? I mean, I just based on what we know, I would say yeah, it's hard it's to so do. That. Hard, it, it's hard to predict. It's hard to do. Uh, I think that uh, Michigan Michigan's had guys like Zach Center that have made it look so easy the last few years, um, but exactly. it's just not. Yeah. So uh, I think that's going to do it for us, Clay. Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. A little bit of a different show this week, given that we uh, we came to you a little uh, earlier or, or same time, but we pre-recorded this episode. But uh, thanks you, thank to you guys for, uh, for sticking around. Uh, we'll be at the Combine later this week. Uh, be sure to like, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, for more, for all of our content, a lot of good stuff coming out of the next several weeks as spring ball gets going for Michigan NFL draft stuff, all of that. Um, recruiting guys, it's all there. So uh, thank you, Clayton. Uh, thank you, producer Megan behind the scenes. Thank you guys for watching and listening. We will talk to you again next time.